Hello, everyone. I'm Malika Kapoor. Welcome to this Bloomberg Invest Talks, a conversation with Michael Corbat. We're so pleased you could join us this morning for what will no doubt be an insightful conversation between City CEO Michael Corbat and Carlyle Group co-founder and co-executive chairman David M. Rubenstein. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. If you're having trouble with audio or video quality, please refresh your browser. Please engage with us on social media. We are active there using the hashtag, hashtag Bloomberg Invest. Finally, we'd like to acknowledge CMC Markets and Google Cloud as the sponsors of today's event. And with that, please join me in welcoming Michael Corbat and David Rubenstein. Hello, I'm David Rubenstein. I'm here today with Michael Corbett, who has for the last eight years been the CEO of Citicorp. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for coming. David, thanks for having me. So uh, let's start today with a discussion of some news that's coming out of Washington. Um, in the last couple of days, the president-elect has announced his economic team. It appears that Janet Yellen will be nominated by him as the new Secretary of the Treasury. I assume you've worked with her over the years. Do you have any comment on her becoming the Secretary of, Tre of Treasury? Well, we, we have. We, we've worked with, uh, with um, Chair, formerly Chair Yellen, Janet, you know, uh, through her time. Uh, at the Fed, and I would say that not just Citi, but I think the, the banking industry had a, a good relationship with her. And uh, you know, if she is elected um, into, or, or if she is voted into the seat, I think um, she'll do a great job. And I would expect that relationship to, to continue. And I'd also you know, shout out another glass ceiling broken in terms of her then becoming the first uh, female secretary of treasury, which would be another great one for the books. Well, so far, the entire economic team seems to be female, which is a good way to break the glass ceiling. The president-elect has announced that uh, C.C. Rouse is likely to be the head of the Council of Economic Advisors, and Neera Tandon is likely to be the uh, head of OMB. Uh, all these are subject to confirmation. So uh, do you have any comment on the entire economic team he's put together? He's trying to put together the best team that he can. Uh, his choices, you know, so far seem like seem like very good ones, and uh, there's certainly more to go. Filling seats, as you say, on a daily basis, and I think it's exciting to watch. And um, and, and I'm sure he'll do his best to put the right team and put the right team on the field. Let's talk about the economy for a moment. Uh, there are many people in Washington and around the country who thinks the think the economy could use another stimulus bill. Uh, we couldn't get one so far uh, before the election, but maybe in the lame duck there might be one, and maybe in the early new Congress. Do you have a view that the economy needs a stimulus bill to, to be able to go forward until we get all the vaccines uh, distributed and widely used? Yeah, I, I think as you point out, David, it's unclear whether we're going to get that new stimulus package between now or uh, late January. But I think if, if we don't get something done um, right now, I think we will get something done in probably fairly early 2021. And I think the question is not going to be the if, but I think it's going to be more about the size and what can get, get passed. And I think that will, you know, be largely determined by the outcome of the Senate races in Georgia. I think right now with COVID-19 cases on the rise, additional stimulus uh, through unemployment checks, PPP loans, rebates are all helpful tools to bolster, bolster the economy and uh, while also helping individuals to recover from the economic hardship of the pandemic experience. And what we know, right, is that, you know, while we're all in the same storm, we're not all in the same boat. And I think if we can get these monies targeted at those most affected, um, I think it would, uh, it would be a, a very good thing in terms of helping restore the economy otherwise quicker than it would. Let's talk about the meaning of, the, let's say we have a stimulus bill. Some people have said, well, we could use a stimulus bill. On the other hand, we can't ignore the fact that the debt is rising quite rapidly. We have about $27 trillion of federal debt, and we're having a budget deficit now of about $3.2 or $3.3 trillion a year for borrowing about half the money that we spend each year. How much longer can we keep borrowing this money without people on Wall Street or people in the general economy saying this is too much borrowing? Are you worried about that? I am. I think we all should be worried about it. I think we've, you know, we've been talking about deficits for a number of years and what is sustainable. I think the, um, the consequence and the prospect of lower for longer in terms of interest rates, 
obviously significantly reduces or holds down that borrowing cost, but we can't believe that rates are going to stay necessarily where they are forever. So we've got to be mindful. And that's why I believe that it's actually very important that we're targeted in terms of getting the monies to those that are, are really in need, because we know that the longer this goes on and the more small business, the more individuals, certain geographies, neighborhoods get affected, it just makes the comeback from that much more difficult. And I think we've seen that and that's been proven, you know, from a historic perspective. Okay, so let's talk about COVID and managing uh, a bank, your bank, and during the COVID. So uh, when COVID hit, let's say around February or March of uh, earlier this year, uh, you were minding your own business, I suspect, running your bank. All of a sudden, you realize people are getting sick and, and we have a virus. When did you say to your employees, work from home? And how did you do that when you have a global organization? Did you do it just in the United States? Or how did you tell people to work from home and work remotely? So, well, you know, we, we do have a, a benefit as being a, a global company. We come to work in about 100 countries every day and that we... Uh, have been and are on the ground and, you know, have been in Asia for a while. And so, you know, we did see firsthand, whether it was in China or other parts of Asia, uh, the early impacts of the virus. And so as the virus made its way west, we were able to take our learnings and to employ them pretty quickly. And actually the first actions that we began to take were probably right around the 1st of February. And, uh, and by obviously the middle of March, we had uh, largely um, moved the bank towards a remote, a remote uh, process. Uh, as part of that, um, a 200 year old institution, we've lived through many challenges, none quite like this one. And I would say that the, the learnings that we had, the, some of the investments that we made along the way allowed us that flexibility to in fact, get our people out of congregated workspace, get them to remote, workspaces and, you know, at, at our peak uh, of our 200,000 employees around the world, we've had simultaneous uh, over 150,000 of those in our systems online and working and being able to support our customers and clients. So it's, I think it's truly been extraordinary. And I think in many ways, we surprised ourselves in terms of our ability uh, to continue on the way we have. And did you yourself work remotely and were you running the bank remotely from your house or were you going into the office? I did. I, uh, I stayed in the office till about the 1st of April. And then with all the lockdowns and, and, and obviously people working remotely, uh, I did work remotely. Um, I came back into the office on a, on a full-time basis or, or largely full-time basis, probably uh, around the first or second week of September. And uh, again, kind of trying to, to watch the different, different pieces. But, you know, for that time period, you know, mainly, mainly in the office. So uh, as we go through a new virus resurgence, it appears, uh, do you expect that we'll have to have more people working remotely? In other words, those who came back to the offices, like you, might have to go back to working remotely, or do you think it's not necessary now? Well, I, I think we've got to watch it. What we've said all along, David, is that we're not going to be div driven by dates. We're going to be driven by data. And I think as, and whether it's been in Asia or whether it's in, in Europe or in the US, we've seen the back and forth where we've brought people in to send them back home. And we're not afraid to do that. And again, I think we've been successful in terms of our ability to work remotely. We, we absolutely like to have our people in when we can have them in, but we're not gonna put them at risk. And so uh, I think we, we've tried to get people back in where we can, but where the cases have come back up and the data has been going the wrong way, we haven't been shy about sending those people back home. And so I think we've got to stay flexible. Uh, let's talk about uh, the situation with respect to uh, layoffs. You have about 200,000 employees. I think you committed that you wouldn't have layoffs for a certain period of time presumably not indefinitely. Uh, what is your view going forward? Will you have to lay off people for some reasons or you think you can go through with your existing employee base pretty much intact? Well, we did. We did in the early part of, of uh, the COVID uh, virus say that we were gonna be mindful and we would stay away from layoffs and we in fact did. Um, you know, throughout that period of time, David, you know, we hired 
um, tens of thousands of employees into our firm. We kept on with normal hiring practices. And I think as technology and as business and as customer and client preferences continue to evolve, it's impossible to say that you're not going to continue to be changing your workforce to make sure that you're meeting uh, meeting those demands and that you're, 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 you're staying competitive with that. So again, we have uh, begun some layoffs. I, I think they've been you know, fairly small in terms of the things that we've, we've been doing. And again, I think our people have performed and worked remotely very well. And uh, again, you know, kind of mindful on both sides of making sure we're continuing to bring the right people in, but at the same time that our business structure remains competitive. Now, many CEOs of large companies like yours are beginning to wonder whether they need all the office space they currently have because employees, when they come back, might only want to come back in the office two or three days a week. And some people might decide that they need to resize their buildings and so forth. Do you expect you'll need all the real estate you have now in the future? The answer is probably not. But I would say that it, in my own belief, it's too early to, to, to declare that meaning that um, our business, the banking business, many businesses are apprenticeship businesses and that we've learned our craft um, by um, physically being together and uh, those experiences being passed down. I think that's an important part of big parts of our business and we don't know how that ages. We don't know uh, over time um, what remote working um, what the ramifications are. We know some of the benefits. People talk about the productivity that comes working remotely. Well, if I work seven days a week, you know, 15, 16 hours a day, I don't take any holidays, at least for a period of time, I'm going to be more productive. But I think there's, there's two axes to that chart. One is certainly the productivity measured over longer periods of time. But I also think the other piece is creativity. And what I'm mindful of is I don't want to wake up as a, as, a, as a company. I don't want to wake up as an industry and have hollowed our skill sets out around moving too quickly towards, towards remote. And I also think the other piece that's important is people join companies for their culture, for the people. And uh, I think it's, it's important that we keep that in mind. So I'm sure we will, we, we've begun and we'll, we'll absolutely continue to accelerate the move towards digital and where appropriate more remote, but I wouldn't certainly want to see us move too quickly. So when you started in the business world and when I started in the business world a little before you, um, people had offices and you know, they measured their success by the size of their office to some extent. Um, more recently, people have been saying, well, let's have open uh, office architecture where you don't have offices. And I think city built out some of those. Do you expect in the future, you'll now have to change that because you'll need to have dividers between everybody or because of the, of the virus, or you're not sure yet? Well, we've, we've, so, so one is we have moved to, towards a more open architecture. But I think actually one of the things that we've seen through this, David, is actually that space giving us flexibility. So as opposed to dedicated offices, we can create neighborhoods, we can create workspaces, we can create workstations for people that they, they can come and go from and they don't necessarily need to be there every day and we can continue to clean to, to make sure that they're safe work environments and we can continually repurpose those. So I think the, the plan that we've moved towards has given us lots of flexibility as we continue to think about what space is going to look like. And obviously in those places where we've had higher uh, densification or, or higher populations, trading floors or other places that have come back to work sooner, we've obviously used uh, plexiglass and other types of things to create shields and to, and to create uh, safe work environments for people to return to. So all the banks, I think, are going to face an issue at the end of the year. A lot of the banks have done reasonably well this year in the COVID period of time because they were able to adapt. They made a fair amount of money. Um, in your case, I think your traders did extremely well this year, but paying out big bonuses often creates uh, political problems in Washington. How do you assess that kind of trade-off, paying out bonuses that people did extremely well versus um, not trying to get a lot of headlines that are going to produce challenges in Washington? Well, I think as, as you see, we, we've got to be balanced in that approach, right? That we've got to be mindful of uh, our returns and our shareholders. We've got to be mindful of the environment. Uh, that we're in and the many challenges that are out there for, for people and for, for certain businesses. Uh, and at the same time, we've got to be competitive. 
um, you know, in our industry. And, you know, we, 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 you know, we're fortunate to have good talent. We've got to recognize that. And so uh, I would say we need to kind of figure our path and thread the needle to, to paying fairly for our people. And again, our people have done extraordinary work and whether it's, it's the traders or right down to the people in our branches that have come in and put themselves in harm's way to make sure that our branches are open and that people have access to their financial lives uh, and, you know, we've seen just, uh, you know, incredible acts of selflessness from our people who've really gone out of their way in these extraordinary times to make sure that our customers and clients get the service that they deserve and our people need to be recognized for that. So let's talk a moment of how you became the CEO. Um, it's an interesting story, but to go back, uh, you grew up in Connecticut? I did. And were you a uh, scholar athlete uh, or an athlete or a scholar or you were both? Uh, in high school, I, I would hope I would hope I was a scholar athlete. So you were recruited to play football at Harvard, or were you, you were recruited as an as an academic, and you actually played football on the side? I would say that the, the the football got me got me in faster than my academics did. Okay, so you went to Harvard as a and you were playing football um, at Harvard. Playing football is that a big deal at Harvard? Or people care about other things, and and was football exciting for you there? It was. It was. You know, I'd, gr I'd grown up playing the game and uh, obviously very much enjoyed it. And, uh, and again, I think that at, at Harvard, we had the right balance. Um, it, I wasn't, they don't give athletic scholarships. And I was playing football, not because I, I had to or needed to uh, around being able to go to school. It was because I wanted to. Uh, at the same time, I, I was an economics major. I very much enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that. Uh, I enjoyed the um, kind of the, the, the left brain, right brain of, of the combination of athletics and, and academia. And, you know, got a lot of exposure to very interesting people, professors, uh, fellow students, uh, relationships and things that, you know, I, I continue to carry to this day. So an all around very positive experience. Now you were an all American football player at Harvard. There aren't that many in recent years, all American football players at Harvard. So were you surprised about that designation and you think maybe I should go to the NFL and not go to the financial world? Well, I, I was. When the phone call came um, back in the day, I was surprised to receive it. Obviously, I was honored to receive it. Uh, but I, I had known from some of my, my work in school, from some of the summer opportunities that I had, uh, that I did want to go into banking. And uh, shortly after the season ended, I did accept an offer. Uh, back in those days to ex to go to one of our predecessor firms, Solomon Brothers, and join the training program there, which was quite well renowned at the time, and um, passed up a, on an opportunity back in those days to to join the USFL and 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 to to not be part of the the NFL draft that year. Okay, so you worked at Salomon, and ultimately you stayed at the Al Salomon and its successor uh, city for quite some time. I think you've been there now 34 years or something like that. 37, 37, 37 years. Okay. So you're working your way up and doing various different things. And then you're heading up to Europe and the Middle East. Is that right? That was my assignment, David, prior to becoming CEO. Right. So you're heading up Europe and the Middle East and you're living in Europe to do that, I assume? I was living in London. All right. So you get a call from uh, the chairman of City saying, guess what? We want you to be the new CEO. Were you surprised? And you say, I really like living in Europe or you say, okay, I'm happy to do it. I was, I was very surprised. Um, for those who, who know or remember the time, uh, back in 2011, my wife and I moved to London to, to run our EMEA, Europe, Middle East and Africa operations. It's our largest operation geographically uh, in, in the firm. And I candidly thought that was likely to be the last stop in my career and that I would kind of serve my time there, do the best job I could. And you know, eventually figure out what's next for me. And so I was quite surprised when 10, 11 months later, the phone call came from our chairman to, uh, to, to contemplate the move to becoming CEO. Okay, your chairman then, I guess, was Mike O'Neill? Correct. So uh, you, he, you bring, he brings you back, you're now the CEO, and you said, uh-oh, we have a lot of problems here. Um, did you realize how, um, how, my, how severe the problems were when you took the job? And did they turn out later to be much more severe than you had initially thought? Well, I think coming coming out of the crisis, we we did a pretty um, significant restructuring of the company, and I was part of that in terms of 
running for a few years our non-core divestiture businesses. Uh, and what I would describe is really taking our company back to its roots. And at its roots, it is a bank. It wasn't an insurance company. It wasn't an asset manager. wasn't those things. And returning it, and I, I think Vikram had, had done a very good job in terms of uh, really setting in place parts of that transformation. Uh, I inherited that, and there was certainly more work to do. And so um, we, we continued, uh, obviously, on with that work. And I'm, I'm quite proud of where we've, you know, where we came out of it and where we've gotten to today, uh, and in particular, based on the challenges that we had at the depths of the crisis. So uh, at the time before you became the CEO, there was a very famous uh, weekend where uh, City had made an offer to buy Wachovia, and it thought that it was going to get it. And then over the weekend, um, another bank got, came in, Wells Fargo, and, and scooped it up, and then ultimately built that a larger retail presence in the East Coast and other places. In hindsight, uh, was that a good decision for you to let it go, or you really had no choice? Or if you had gotten uh, Wachovia, it would have been much better for the bank to be where it is today. Well, at first, I have to say that I wasn't directly involved right. in that, but I'll give, uh, I'll give one person's opinion, and that is I think it would have been um, an acquisition that would have been very helpful and accretive to our consumer business. Because as we know, in banking, and in particular in consumer banking, scale matters. And I think Wachovia would have given us a national footprint in our branch system that would match our national footprint in our credit card business. And I think putting those two things together would have been very powerful, uh, would have been a very powerful combination for us. But that being said, when, when it did go to Wachovia, you know, we, we needed to, to move on and we needed to focus to really with the hand that we're playing. And that's exactly what we've done. So when I was little, um, I had a little savings account and uh, they gave you a little passbook and you go to the bank and they would stamp in how much money you might deposit and so forth like that. I forget what they were called, passbooks or something Pass like books. that. And so, uh, you know, you're proud to have your amount of money in there, the interest you get each month or whatever it was. Uh, but everybody went to these bank branches that were, you know, very august looking things and they were imposing looking in some ways. But do we really need all these branch banks now because people do so much online? Do you, how many branch banks does City have in the United States or around the world? But well, we've got about 2,000, 2,000, a little over 2,000 around the world. That number's come down. And I think one of the things that's coming out of COVID is the acceleration to digital. And whether it's remote uh, deposit capture or paying bills or digital transfers or any of those things, we've seen a, uh, quite a large acceleration of, uh, of people using those channels. And I think that's exciting. And what we've done or what, what we describe as having happened is we've actually pulled those timelines forward. And, um, but I think we've also got to be mindful, David, in banking that we serve a continuum. We serve um, younger people like you know, yourself when you were young and you had your passbook all the way through retirees. And within there, there's a different set of expectations amongst uh, our customers. Some people very much like the branch. And if we called up and said, hey, great news, we're closing the branch and we're going 100% to digital, we would likely lose some of those customers. There's those uh, like myself and my wife who very much enjoy the combination of the analog and the digital relationship, having everything at our fingertips when we need it, but also knowing that I've got somebody I can call or a branch that I can go to when I need those services. And then clearly, you know, from the younger generations, we're seeing them living the predominance of their financial lives um, remotely or digitally. And, um, you know, that's coming and we'll see if their preferences change. But in many ways, what I describe is we're, we're kind of managing uh, the transition of an analog bank to and through a digital bank. And so many ways managing the two banks in, in tandem and making sure that we can offer those services uh, as customer preferences demand. So um, how often do you go into a branch bank and uh, do they recognize you? I assume you don't wait at the line. You have to, you go right to the head of the line. Uh, well, I, I absolutely do wait in line and uh, I, I do go in, uh, you know, I go in a, a probably a, a dozen times a year, maybe once a month or so a year. And I also, in my travels, do branch visits. And as I said, I, I think that the people in our branch system were extraordinary heroes in terms of, you know, coming to work every day 
uh, all through lockdowns, not just in the US around the world to make sure that we were open and that we were able, uh, you know, as I described, when our customers wanted that physical service to make sure it was there. And so I also make it part of my business that when I'm out and about just to stop in and to see the people and thank them for what they're doing. So let's go through the main businesses of, of City. Uh, you have the Consumer Bank, which is, which is people do retail, and I assume that's a profitable business still, or you wouldn't be in it. It is, and, and, and I would say that in many ways, David, the backbone of our retail business is our global cards franchise, our credit card. And I know that you are a proud city I, card, I think American Airlines carrying member. So thank you very I much. Am. And uh, you know, we, we operate uh, consumer businesses in about 19 countries uh, around the world. And it's the combination of cards, lending, uh, as well as a depository, as well as wealth management. So, um I do have the credit card and um, I'm very happy with it. But, um, you know, once in a while it gets denied a little bit. And I just wonder, do you ever have denial problems? I do on occasion. What do you do? You call up and doing, say- If I'm doing something that kind of falls outside the ordinary, uh, oftentimes I'll get questions back asking, you know, is it, is it me? And you don't say, I'm the CEO of this organization, you never say that? I don't. Okay, so that's the consumer business. And then you have the um, institutional business, which is doing, uh, I guess, financings for large corporations and so forth. And that's still a pretty profitable business. It is. And if you go to the backbone of that business, I think it's really off of the back of, of what we call our TTS, our Treasury and Trade Solutions business, which is really a, uh, a, a money movement payment processing business. We process over uh, $4 trillion of payments a day uh, all over the world. In, in you know pretty much every currency that's out there. And obviously lending, uh, our markets, our banking, our investment banking, uh, our advisory, our capital raising businesses, uh, all, all, all come off of that. So um, under the Volcker rule, um, banks were not supposed to be doing any proprietary trading and I guess proprietary investing in private equity to some extent. Has that been loosened a bit and, are, and you think it's wise to loosen it? Or do you think uh, the constraints that were imposed by the Volcker rule are pretty good? Uh, you know, I, I think that the, um, the challenges in there, and in particular, and I don't want to get too technical around the S testations, is that uh, the regulators can't necessarily agree on exactly what that is. But proprietary trading is not, is not what we do. Investing in, in private equity is not what we do. You know, we're here as a market-based facilitator creating markets, transacting, raising capital, and doing those things. And so I think we, we find ourselves pretty, uh, living pretty easily uh, and consciously inside of those bounds that have, that have been set. And I, again, I don't, think it, I don't think it takes in any way from who we are, the things that we can do for our clients. Well, let's talk about some new trends that are going on in the financing world. One of them is so-called FinTech, which means using technology to enhance the ability to get uh, things done through banks and other kinds of financial uh, service organizations. How have you been involved a lot in FinTech at City and you use a lot of AI to help you in FinTech? Well, we, we, we have been. We, we've obviously been very involved in terms of the push to digital. And the, you know, the nice thing about the push to digital is that it generally creates a better customer client experience. And I think one thing that's, that's important about that is understanding that the way we think about it is not uh, creating a best in bank experience, but it's really creating or trying to match a best in life experience. Meaning that as people live their lives, whether it's the Uber or the other apps that are there, how can we create a banking, uh, a, a, a banking experience that rivals those types of things? And I think the competition, the energy, the, um, the smarts, uh, the investment, I think have all led to not just city, but the industry being better. And you know, in there, it's, it's, we don't necessarily think of FinTech as the competition. FinTech in many ways is a big part of the future. And so what you've seen us doing in many ways is not just embracing the technology, but it's embracing some of the participants using our strengths in terms of our global presence using our strengths in terms of our scale to match with some of their agility, some, with, some of their new processes, 
to create things that are that are new and outside the traditional bounds. And so, you know, whether that's been on the customer experience side or uh, very much uh, prevalent in terms of our cyber work and the things that we're doing to protect our bank and to protect uh, our banking clients, uh, a lot of those things, you know, we're, we're not we're not inventing, right? We know that there's better places for those places to be done. And so uh, we've partnered, we've made investments in some of uh, those companies, we've created different um, uh, arrangements around some of those. And, you know, whether it's been uh, with Google or some of the other things you've seen us uh, announce, not just here in the United States, I think it's quite exciting, and in particular around the future of banking. Well, you mentioned cyber. Let's talk about that. What are the chances that um, I have a credit card account there and I maybe I have a savings account or something. The chances are that somebody's going to break in and get my information. How much time and money do you spend to prevent that kind of cyber um, attack? Well, I would say that you know, one of, if not the fastest growing areas within inside our institution is our work around cyber in terms of people, uh, in terms of resources spent. Uh, and, and we have to take and we have to have that mindset because obviously it's not going away. And in fact, when you get into stressful periods like the pandemic, um, those bad actors, as they're called, try and use those opportunities to exploit your weaknesses. And so we've invested heavily uh, along the ways. And, you know, like other institutions, we're attacked all the time. But uh, our team, I think, has done a a, a great job. They certainly don't rest on their laurels. And we know that the threat and the threat factors continue to evolve. Uh, we've also, I think, had good partnerships with other institutions. So the big banks are allowed legally to share information in this space. And, and we do because we view it uh, not as a competitive strength to, to be better than the next bank, but we're, you know, we're only as strong as the system. And so uh, we're not just working for our own efforts, we're working for the system and, and the entirety of the system uh, and working in close partnership with the government. And I think so far that has you know, served us well, but with the same recognition that we can't, uh, we can't let our guard down you know, at all. Um, I'm not a big online banking person. Uh, you might not be surprised to hear, given my age, I tend to do old fashioned things. So I have these checkbooks and I still write checks out. Is that business going away? Uh, you know, well, we can say eventually it is, David, but interesting, um, I haven't seen the numbers uh, of late, but I think the year in uh, 2019, there was still somewhere around 25 billion checks written in the United States. And actually, interestingly, as advanced as the US economy is, the US has probably been amongst the most reticent in terms of being willing to give up the checkbook. I remember being and living in London in the UK in the, in, in the, in the early 2000s, and you know, we'd already moved beyond checking. And, but you know, there's parts of the US and, and you know, certain um, um, age groups or, or, or certain cohorts that you know, still enjoy their checkbook. We certainly offer lots of opportunities around paying bill directly and paying bill online or you know, creating repeating services that pay the longstanding things you have. And David, if you, you'd like to look into any of that, we'd be happy to get a banker to work with you. Okay, so what about ATM? Is that a profitable business? And why do people get upset when they get charged fees for using ATMs? Well, I, we, we certainly don't view the ATM as, as a profit center. And obviously, if you're a city customer and, you know, we've got tens of thousands of ATMs kind of all over the place and um, they're, they're there. And we, I would say, view it more as, I don't know if the right word is necessity, but it's, it's part of what you need in today's society to make sure that people have access to their cash where and when they want it. I think you know a good good news is, and I think COVID has has shown us is that you know we do have alternatives digitally to um, to to cash. And again, interestingly, the U.S. is still a predominantly cash society. I think we've seen a, a deceleration, or we've seen a slowdown in terms of that cash usage. And we've seen obviously digital uptake coming up. Many merchants today don't want to accept cash. Uh, around uh, around the, the safety and hygiene potentially of that. Um, but, you know, we still have to make it available. And 
I think our, our ATM network and footprint reflects demand. And like our branch network, as that demand comes down and preferences shift, we'll certainly adjust our ATMs to that. What about cryptocurrencies? Do you think they're the wave of the future or you think they're something that is a passing fancy? Well, I think it depends. It depends what, um, what the underlying nature of that currency is. You know, some are, some in essence are stored value. You know, some have been compared to modern day gold. Uh, some have been, you know, compared to alternatives. And I think that cryptocurrency, so, so one is I think that we will see in the not too distant future, a sovereign, I wouldn't say crypto, I'd say digital currency coming out. We've been working with some governments around the world in terms of the creation and commercialization of that. And I think it's inevitable that that will be coming. And I think that uh, some of these currencies will, will just be uh, continued uh, alternatives, uh, continued different sources of payment that people can take advantage of kind of based on the underlying nature of what they are. I see. Around the world, uh, one of the issues uh, of late, or maybe in the last couple of decades, is that sometimes people show up with enormous amounts of cash, and you don't know where they got the cash, and they want to deposit it. How does city make certain that the money has a legitimate source before you take an account? Well, we, we've got to do a, a background check, but we've got to do, in essence, the due diligence. And for those that have opened um, opened accounts. We ask, every, you know, the industry asks lots of questions. It's not necessarily because we want to or, or you, know, you know, it's kind of thrive on asking as many questions, but those are questions that are necessary around knowing who you are, what they call the KYC rule, the know your customer rule, and what the, the sources of income or what the sources of monies are, and to, and to understand that customer and the way that they'll be using the bank. And obviously that's all done to protect the system, to protect from money launders, to protect from criminals, uh, to protect from the bad actors that are out there uh, and the control of you know, trying to limit monies that are available to move into illegal or improper sectors. Uh, and obviously between the institutions and the government, we dedicate a lot of resources and we work quite hard at it. Okay, so uh, let me ask you about one new uh, area of finance that the uh, city's been a leader in, which is called SPAC, which is a Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation. Uh, why are they so popular all of a sudden? And is this a good thing for the economy? And are they uh, proliferating too much? Well, I think, you know, SPACs have, have kind of tickled a... Um, a desire, and that is, you know, when you look at SPACs, the reason for uptakes of SPACs, as you know well, is, is not any one or specific thing, that some people view them as an alternative path to the IPO. Some people view them as a, as a, a way of kind of stepping into certain investments and uh, amassing and consolidating. Uh, some people like the, the structure uh, and the time that comes as a consequence of the SPAC and your ability to call on and to deploy those monies. So I think at a, a point in time where people are looking some some flexibility, I think SPACs have, uh, have, have risen to that. Um, you know, people do say that, gee, there's a lot being done and, you know, is that for proliferation really healthy? Uh, again, I think like anything, provided things are being done for the right reason, and I think they, they largely are being done for the right reasons, um, that, that, you know, the, the, the time of test, the, the test of time will certainly um, speak to that. And, and again, around our our client base, I think, you know, we've seen a number of, you know, very savvy institutional clients, private equity, uh, investors, you know, companies using the SPAC process um, that to, uh, to, to give them some of that flexibility. So as we talk uh, today, uh, you will be stepping down as CEO, I think in February of next year, is that right? That's so correct. after eight years. And so are you looking forward to that? Or are you saying, well, maybe I really like one of my job and maybe I would stay a couple more years if I could, but I'm, I'm going to be leaving. So how do you look at it? Bittersweet or what's your perspective? So you know, one is, uh, is I very much enjoy my job, like my job. I, I love the company. It's the only place that I ever worked. Uh, you know, as I say, I graduated on a Friday and I started work on a Monday and going on 38 years later, here I am. Uh, so um, no other place would have me, but, but here I am. 
Um, but I, I also believe, David, that, that you know, in, in these times that you know, some of these jobs should have term limits. Um, and uh, my own belief is that you know, in, in my run, uh, I'm proud of what we've accomplished, but I know there's more to do. And I know, you know Jane is very capable. She's gonna be a fantastic CEO. And that Jane and the management team that we've put together, uh, I think is very up for the next chapter of City. We're a 200 year old institution. And uh, I think has, has, a great, has a great future, has its best days ahead of it. And I'm proud in terms of how we're leaving it. And in particular proud in terms of the team that's gonna be there to lead it into the, into the future. So when you came in and uh, replaced uh, uh, your predecessor, uh, did he call you later and say, you're doing this wrong or this, you know, change this or this? Did he give you a lot of advice and you expect to call your successor and say, well, you should do this differently? Or how do you expect to have a relationship with your successor? That's an always a complicated situation, I guess. So um, we're, we're going through transition now and transition was important to me because I didn't really have the, the benefit of a, of a transition. Uh, my, my appointment was fairly abrupt. And um, Jane and I, I think, are, are working closely. And uh, I kind of deal with the day to day, and she deals with the future of the company. I think that's appropriate. And kind of going through all the year end processes, all the budgeting and planning, all of the strategy work, all of the year end things that go on, and really giving her a chance to kind of live and see those things up close, uh, I think is going to be valuable to her. Um, I will stay out of the way when my time comes, but I'll always be available. I'll be available to her. I'll be available to the firm uh, if they should ever want to reach out. But uh, you know, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to be armchair uh, armchair quarterbacking. I'm not going to be second guessing. I know at times how difficult the job is, and I have respect for that. So uh, let's talk about uh, the recovery from the Great Recession. Uh, all the major banks had some challenges for sure. And they took money from the federal government. Some wanted to take it, some didn't want to take it, but they all took it. Um, and now 10 years plus later, uh, do you think Citi has recovered as much as the other banks have or as much as you would like them to see? And do you think Citi's lagged behind some of the other banks in terms of recovering from the Great Recession? Well, I would start out by saying that I think since the last crisis, we've done a lot of work. I think all banks have in terms of building capacity and cushions and being able to serve the economy through challenging periods like the one we're experiencing now. Every company, every bank has been on their own journey, and I'm not going to comment on the transformation of, of my peers, but I feel very comfortable saying that the scope of the transformation that Citi underwent since the financial crisis uh, has been large, it's been you know, enormous. And I think as a result of our improved focus in investments, City undoubtedly became a simpler, safer, and stronger institution. We improved the quality and consistency of our earnings. We significantly increased our returns for, for our investors. And as examples, David, you know, when I took over, um, I inherited net income of about seven and a half billion dollars. The end of last year, 2019, that was over 19 billion dollars. Our return on assets went from under 40 basis points to right about 100 basis points. Our return on tangible common equity increased from 5% to 12%, closing the gap with our peers. We went from returning really no capital to returning nearly $80 billion of capital to our shareholders over the last six years and reducing our share count by about 30%. So um, are we done? No. Um, are we, uh, I, I, the, the words I use, we should be pleased, but not satisfied. And I think that the, the team that's, that's taking the field here is ready to continue to push city to the next chapter. And there's always more work to be done. So when you talk about the transition, let's talk about what you're going to do next. Uh, um, my observation is that when one is the CEO of something like city, uh, you can get your calls returned in about one second or so, not hard to get a meeting with anybody you want to see. Uh, are you thinking that's going to continue the same when you're not the CEO? Your people will call you back right away. Or you can go see anybody you want in the, in the world. Well, I would say first that the, my seat at City, you know, this number of seats I've had, but in particular, this seat has you know, given me the, uh, the opportunity, the, the, real, the real opportunity to get to, to meet and know a, a number of very interesting people, not just in the US, but, but around the world. And at the end of the day, I also do recognize that a number of those relationships aren't necessarily mine. 
but they're the company's relationships as they should be. And those, you know, those relationships will stay with the, with the company. Um, uh, along the way, you do you do make some friends, and so uh, I'm not sure every phone call will 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 be returned as as punctually as it maybe once was, but I I will come out of this with a, a number of of friendships and people that I've gotten to know along the way that I hope to be able to stay in in touch with the future and to uh, you know c c continue to stay involved with. So when you step down and you're um, not the CEO, you expect to take some time off to uh, rest or do you expect to get right back into the fray and what you, would you consider the highest calling of mankind as I've called the private equity or, or what are you thinking of doing? Well, I think right now my objective is, as they say, to run through the tape that I'm just really focused on the transition and, and giving Jane the best transition I can give her uh, and obviously uh, focused on delivering and closing out, out the year. Um, when February comes, I plan to step back. And for now, David, I've declared the highest calling in life uh, in terms of what's next for me is to become a grandparent. I'm on the verge of becoming a grandparent. I look forward to that. It'll be our first grandchild. Uh, and then to step back and take a little time. It obviously 38 years at one institution, eight years in my current role, uh, to take some time to decompress a, a little bit and to you know, see what's out there and figure out what the next chapter. I, I still feel I've got another chapter. I'm uh, in my own mind relatively young. I still got a lot to learn. I'm still interested. And so uh, whatever that may be, I, I look forward to, to exploring that. And I think the exploration is going to be a big part of the fun. Well, you're, you are very young. I mean, you're what, the new president of the United States is about, uh, what, 17 years older or something like that. So, um, you know, you're very, very young. So you've, you've got a long way to go. So final question is, um, to somebody who is looking forward to graduating from college this year, why would you recommend that he or she go into the financial services world and particularly a bank like Citi? Why wouldn't somebody say, well, it's too big a bank. I'm not going to learn anything. I'll never rise to the top. Why should somebody want to go into a bank uh, today? It's different than when you came in 38 years ago, or is it not different in your view? Well, I think it is different, and, and it was exciting back then. Uh, based on a number of things that were that were going on, some of the deregulation in the early 80s, as you remember, and how that changed financial services. And I think that, you know, right now we're in the, the midst of a big transition. And that's, as we talked about, it's this transition from analog to digital. And I think getting in on the ground floor around fintech and around that move and what, you know, finance is going to reinvent itself as as we go forward, uh, in many ways, there's probably, certainly in recent history, not a not a, a more exciting time to be to be joining the industry. And I think you're going to continue to see massive change within the industry. I think at City, you'll you'll see us continue to evolve the institution. And I think our benefits of scale and presence and longstanding relationships and the things that we've had in the investments are going to serve uh, serve uh, serve our company well. And by the way, I would be remiss if I didn't say the industry. I think is you know you look at coming out of the last financial crisis and where the industry is today, not to, to overstep or overspeak, but I think you know the industry in particular here in the US, but around the globe has really um, functioned or, or operated as a source of strength, that we're in a health pandemic that has significant economic ramifications. And I think that the financial services industry has really brought to life a number of these governmental fiscal monetary programs. And I think our ability from an economic, from a policy, from a societal perspective uh, to be there, uh, really weighing in on important issues. And, and that's just not the economic, but it's the environment, it's society, uh, and a number of the things that we've been through. And I think uh, you know, the, the, the banks have, have played an important role and I think only become potentially more important as we as we go forward. And so I would tell everybody it's an exciting time to join. I think you'll really enjoy it. And you know, if you have, you kind of have half the fun that I had, I think it's a great, it's a great calling. Well, congratulations on becoming a grandfather shortly. And I, I know you'll enjoy it. And thank you very much for a very interesting conversation, Michael, and best wishes to you in your next career, whatever that might be. David, thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate all the help and support along the way. You've been great. Thank you. Thank Thank you for joining Bloomberg Invest Talks, a conversation with Michael Corbat. Thanks again to Michael and to David for joining us today. 
We'd also like to thank CMC Markets and Google Cloud for making today's event possible. If you'd like more information on CMC Markets, please go to the handout tab on your screen. And for ongoing coverage and other stories, please go to Bloomberg.com and follow Bloomberg on Twitter. Our handles are at Bloomberg Live and at Business. Thank you for watching.